Okay, looks like we're live again. Hopefully the volume is better. It'll be a few minutes before I, or a few seconds anyway, before I know. There's a 30 second delay between what I'm saying and what you're hearing. So uh, I found that out today and, and timed that out. But it looks like I have a strong on the microphone now. So hopefully that'll be enough to carry through. So anyway, in Revelation chapter five, recall that the one who sat upon the throne in heaven God the Father, he had this seven-sealed scroll in his right hand. And this mighty angel, whom we said last time was Gabriel, cried out, he said, Who is worthy to open this scroll and to loose its seals? And the apostle John, who was in heaven's throne room, he wept greatly over this, uh, because initially there was no one found who was worthy. But then we saw that Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who was slain, appeared in heaven. And Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, he took the seven-sealed scroll from the right hand of God, his Father, who was seated on the throne. For he was worthy to open it. For some background on these sealed scrolls, we looked at a passage in the book of Jeremiah where Jeremiah was called out to basically get his cousin out of jail. It was Jeremiah 32, verses 6 to 12, if you're interested in the story. If Jeremiah would exercise his right to purchase the property of his cousin, well, that would free his cousin, uh, Hanamel, from debt and from prison. You see, there was a law involved here. Jeremiah had the legal right to redeem that property because he was known as the kinsman redeemer. He was kin, you know, uh, related, a cousin to Hanamel, and he was going to buy the property. It, it allowed family to protect family in situations such as Hanamel found himself in. As our kinsman redeemer, we see Jeremiah 32, 6 to 12 here. Jeremiah said that the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Behold, Hanamel, the son of Shalom, your uncle, will come to you, saying, Buy my field, which is in Anathoth. And I highlighted this for you. For the right of redemption is yours to buy it. He was the kinsman redeemer. He had the authority. He had the power, the right to do what he was doing. As our kinsman redeemer, Jesus Christ alone has the authority to open the seals on that scroll. For he alone paid the price to redeem the earth. Only he could pay it. Only his blood would satisfy. And we saw that this scroll is the title deed to the earth. The 24 elders around the throne sang a new song in praise to the Lamb. And they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. These uh, people, these 24 elders, have been redeemed by God, redeemed to God by the blood of Christ. And, has, and they've, he've, he's made us to be kings and priests. This is the church, and, uh, which is one of the reasons why I think those 24 elders do represent the church. It's a thought. Um, now, that the title deed to the earth is in the hands of its rightful owner. We're going to see that things are ready for judgment to fall on the earth because he has the right to do that. Jesus Christ the Lord is prepared to begin to open the seven seals. And so thus we come to Revelation chapter 6. So what is chapter 6 all about? There's an easy way to remember Chapter 6 is about six of the seven seals on that document. Six seals will be opened in Revelation chapter 6. The seventh seal will not be opened until chapter 8. The first four seals of this document 
are the infamous four horsemen of the apocalypse. And you have them represented there on the screen in kind of a theatrical way, I suppose. There's no horses, but there's a guy dressed up like all four of them in different uh, makeup and, and costume and so forth. Um, but anyhow, it looks like in every case he could probably go into a store. He's got a mask on. Anyway, um, anyway, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. There really are four horses of different colors uh, here in, in this uh, uh, description that we'll read. But for comparison, before we get to that, I found it interesting to read about four different colors of horses along with four chariots that they're drawing in uh, Zechariah chapter 6. Zechariah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. And Zechariah says this, Then I turned and raised my eyes and looked, and behold, four chariots were coming from between two mountains, and the mountains were mountains of bronze. With the first chariot were red horses, with the second chariot, black horses, with the third chariot, white horses, and with the fourth chariot, dappled horses, strong steeds. Then I answered and said to the Lord who talked with me, What are these, my Lord? And the angel answered and said to me, These are four spirits of heaven who go out from their station before the Lord of all the earth. So these are spirits, okay? I think there's a connection there to the four horsemen in Revelation 6. The one with the black horses is going to the north country, the white are going after them, and the dappled are going toward the south country. Then the strong steeds went out, eager to go, that they might walk to and fro throughout the earth. And he said, Go, walk to and fro throughout the earth. And so they walked to and fro throughout the earth. And he called to me and spoke to me, saying, See, those who go toward the north country have given rest to my spirit in the north country. So these four chariots represent four spirit beings that are commanded by God to walk to and fro throughout the earth. Hey, have you ever heard that phrase credited to any other spiritual being in the Bible? <laughs> Job chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, a divine council assembly here in Job 1. And Satan also came among them, and the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. So a spirit being going out walking to and fro on the earth, even if one like Satan. God is omniscient, okay? He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. He knows all things. He sees everything. It's not so with angelic beings. Though they are powerful creatures to be sure, as finite beings like us, they too are confined to time and to location. I don't know how fast they can get from location to location. Uh, probably a whole lot faster than I can. Um, but nonetheless, they still are limited by the, in that way. In any case, these four horsemen of Revelation 6 seem to likewise be spiritual beings or heavenly beings of some sort or other. The four horsemen of Revelation 6 are going to be set out upon the earth by the opening of the first four seals in much the same way as we saw the chariots and horses in Zechariah chapter 6. Okay? The, the judgment of God upon the earth begins. This is what starts it off. And here is uh, Revelation 6, verse 1, to review these different horses and horsemen who show up. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. 
Jesus Christ, the lamb that had been slain, opens the first seal. And one of the cherubim calls out to the apostle John, come and see what emerges on the scene via this open seal. Look and see what's going to happen, John. You're supposed to write it down, everything that you see, so come watch this. A voice like thunder. It says the angel has a voice like thunder. I wonder what a voice like thunder actually sounds like. From everything that I have read so far, and that we have shared together in Revelations 4, uh, Revelations, uh, not Revelations, it's not plural, Revelation chapters 4, 5, and 6, we need to disabuse ourselves of this image that heaven is something like a very quiet place with harp music sounding like the elevator music here on earth. Everything is loud in heaven. Hey, when we sing praise in church, we need to sing out. We need to sing out with heart. We need to sing out with conviction. We need to sing out with a deep love for our Savior. If we aren't sensing that deep love, we need to pray to the Holy Spirit to give us that love for our Savior that we might rightly praise Him and lift up and magnify His name. Sing out loud. Hey, that's what they do in heaven, right? Let's see what this first horseman is like. Get it over here on the screen for you. There you go. A little bit different graphic look. Revelation 6 and verse 2. And I looked and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him. And he went out conquering and to conquer. Now the crown is given to the rider of the white horse. Okay, uh, and, and, and it's not a kingly crown. This is the crown of a victor, okay, so one who has conquered, all right? The crown was given, and I think that is important to distinguish it from the idea that he inherited it or, or uh, took it by force or something like that. It was given to him. He conquers, as it says here, but again, not by force. Notice, Take a look at the verse, and you can even see it in the image a little bit. This leader is carrying a bow, but no arrows. And yet he goes out to conquer. Likely he wins people over with his words. Certainly it's not done by military power. In fact, a white horse seems to indicate that there is an initial moment of world peace when he shows up on the scene. Now, some commentators view this rider as the Antichrist. His peace is a false peace. It's a very temporary peace. We see from the Apostle Paul's first letter to Thessalonica about the coming day of the Lord. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, reading from chapter 5 here, verses 1 through 3, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. The rider of the white horse in Revelation 6 and verse 2 has been given this victor's crown. He is a ruler heading out to conquer. But his peace that he brings is not going to last. I'm reminded of another place in the Bible speaking about the Antichrist, where he is called the prince who is to come, which is found in Daniel chapter 9. Here's part of verse 26 and another part of verse 27. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end of it shall be with a flood. Until the end of the war, desolations are determined. And then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. Now, 
Please note that this prince who is to come has not yet come. He had not yet come in Daniel's day. He had not come yet in the Apostle John's day. And he has not yet come in our day as well. But his people, it says in Daniel, will have already been known. The people of the prince who is to come. Back in 70 AD, the people of the prince who is to come, the Romans, they did indeed destroy the city and the sanctuary. They destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD, the Romans did. And they destroyed the temple, even as Jesus prophesied in Matthew 24. Notice, too, at the end of this verse here, this passage we have here on the screen, notice, too, a covenant, an agreement by words, is confirmed by this prince with many for one week. Someday, I hope to cover this marvelous prophecy of Daniel chapter 9 with you in much more detail. For now, please understand, this week here that's referred to is not a week of seven days. Okay? It's not a week of seven days. Rather, it is a week. The Hebrew word literally means seven. It is a set of seven composed of seven years, not seven days, a seven-year period. The Antichrist confirms a peace agreement with Israel, the people of Daniel, for a seven-year-long period. And this peace agreement is what begins the time of God's judgment, the seven-year tribulation on the earth. In this fashion, then, the rider on the white horse of Revelation 6 and the prince who is to come in Daniel chapter 9 are prophecies that complement one another. They come together. Both come at the beginning of a time of judgment to come. It is therefore reasonable to see them as referring to this same person. Now, comparing this with 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 1, uh, well, actually, uh, not, chapter, not verse 1, but the passage where we were at just a little bit ago, which we just read a moment ago. Uh, please take note of how Paul um, uh, tells the Thessalonian believers, uh, it is chapter, verse 1, but more than 1, 1 through 3. He says this, But concerning the time and the seasons, brethren, here's the emphasis, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. Interesting that they have no need for Paul to write to them about this subject because he has already written them all about it. Okay, He's already taught them all about this. That's really important to note. Far too many folks, far too many uh, in church leadership today and I guess they mean well, but they will say, we shouldn't teach Bible prophecy. It's, it's just too confusing. There's so many different ways of looking at it, so many different ideas. It just confuses people, can create arguments and division. Well, the things that create arguments and division are our hearts, folks, our sinful hearts. It's not the Word of God. Being prideful over the position we hold, not approaching the Word of God humbly, not approaching each other humbly. These are the kind of things that create arguments. Teaching the Bible does not create an argument, okay? And if you want to fight me about it, I'll see you later. I'm kidding. I'm kidding, all right? Anyway, they claim that the interpretation of prophecy uh, in the manner that I'm sharing with you today, that, that's a, that this is a new way of doing it, a relatively new way, just within the last couple hundred years or so. And, and, and so this wasn't uh, taught by the apostles at all. And so we, sh we shouldn't be, be putting this out there. It was, it was mis people were misled back in the beginning of the 19th century. So, so we shouldn't concern ourselves with prophecy teaching at all. Uh, if, the, if the apostles weren't doing it, well, we shouldn't do it either. But according to Paul, right here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, you know, he was teaching a full-fledged, uh, a completely 
uh, fleshed out understanding of the end times. Listen to what uh, he wrote in his uh, second letter to them. Now, let me get it up here for you. Oops, back it up. One wrong button. I'm doing this with my left hand over here today, so uh, I'm right-handed, and my right hand's over here trying to help, but my left hand says, I've got this. So there we go. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. Now look at what he, he writes here. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering to him, now see, that to me, that sounds like two separate events. There's the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, where he comes all the way to earth, and there's also our gathering to him, where we meet him in the air, in the rapture. So there's two different things going on here, in my humble opinion. Okay, um, we, we ask you, he says, not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. They, they thought they got a letter from Paul that said that the day of Christ had already come, and they felt that they had missed it. He had taught them about it, but they felt that they had missed it. So he's helping to clarify a few things here. He says, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day of Christ will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of per perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember, Paul says, that when I was still with you, I told you these things? Obviously, Paul had taught them things about the last days. We've seen that he had explained to them truth about this man of sin. He taught them about the Antichrist to come. It would really be wrong to represent the early church as being ignorant about things to come. They were not ignorant. The apostles taught them things, wrote things down for us to learn. Okay? Okay. <laughs> Now we're going to return to this character, the Antichrist, later in our study of Revelation. But before we leave this rider on the white horse, I thought it might be helpful to read to you some of John Wolverd's comments on the, the vision of this first seal. When, when we began our study of Revelation, I, I told you that today there are four main views on how to interpret Bible prophecy. There's the preterist view, which says that, that everything prophesied has pretty much happened. It all took place back in the first century in the days of the apostles. Okay. Then there's the historicist idea uh, that uh, prophecy is really kind of an unfolding of, of church history. That's what Revelation basically is anyway, is how they say it. And, and there's events that are predicted, the French Revolution and the rise of Islam and other things. And we talked about that a little bit. But the problem with the historicists is they all have different views on what the things mean. And so they disagree with each other. And it's kind of hard to arrive at a consensus when you've got that kind of method of interpreting the scripture. Uh, the idealist view that really what Revelation is all about is it's a, it's a, 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 a picture of of good versus evil, and these are uh, picture stories, uh, they're analogies, they're allegories, uh, they're, they're metaphors for the, the battle between good and evil, and they have no basis in reality at all. And then there's the futurist who says, yes, they do have a basis in reality, this is what I hold. These are prophecies of things that are yet to come, events that are going to happen, because the book itself claims that that's what they are, and we've seen some of that. Anyway, now these viewpoints... Uh, some of them, anyway, have impacted how some folks identify who this first rider is on the white horse. And John Walvoord talks about that in his commentary. He writes, uh, More diverse explanations have been given of verse 2 of chapter 6 than probably any other portion of the entire book of Revelation. Of the many possibilities, two stand out is worthy of mention. Some believe the rider of the white horse is none other than Christ himself. A more plausible explanation is 
that the rider of the white horse is none other than the prince that shall come of daniel nine twenty six. and see you thought that i made that up all by myself or something <laughs> no lots of people believe this okay <laughs> anyway uh the prince that shall come of daniel nine twenty six, who is to head up the note this revived roman empire and ultimately become the world ruler the prince of the people who is to come who destroy the city and the sanctuary were romans okay anyway Ainsley, now he, I'm not sure who Ainsley is here that he's talking about. Ainsley believes the rider of the white horse will appear at the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel. And that the rider, now that's the, 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 the final week, that last week, that's that, that period for the covenant for one week. That's the 70th week of Daniel. And that the rider himself is the Roman prince of an empire that must rise again to fulfill the great prophecies of the book of Daniel. He is Satan's masterpiece. The Antichrist is Satan's masterpiece. He's the counterfeit of all that Christ is or claims to be. See, he wants the glory that belongs only to Christ. He's not worthy to open the seals. Only Christ can. But he wants to be Christ's replacement. And he is therefore cast in the role of a conqueror. And he said, and, and uh, Wolverd says, which seems to be the significance of the white horse, a victor's horse, a victor's crown, and a temporary peace at that. So as the judgment of the seven-year tribulation begins, the first seal is opened and the Antichrist is revealed. Let's take a look at the next seal, okay? Revelation 6 and verse 3. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come and see. Now, of interest here is that each of the cher four cherubim, you have these four cherubim who are around God's throne. And it seems that each one of them is associated with his own seal of the first four seals. When the first seal was open, one of the was to be opened, one of the living creatures said to John, come and see. And now it happens again with this uh, uh, individual uh, being, uh, cherubim. Uh, he's, he's there for the second seal. So it's a different guy this time. So they apparently, and you'll see that there's a third one and a fourth one, of course, and they all fit that. Recall that these cherubim were said to be full of eyes, all right? Uh, they're, they're full of eyes. Come and see, all right? Come and look. I, I've got lots of eyes, John. You've only got two. You've got to come over here to see it, all right? We, we said at the time, uh, back in Chapter 4, that, that the, these eyes that they have, really what it meant was they were watching, watching throughout the entire earth. Now, this is very much akin to the behavior we discussed earlier about the four spirits heading out uh, in Zechariah's gospel, or book, in gospel, yeah, Zechariah's prophecy. Uh, uh, they, they were walking to and fro throughout the earth. Now, there's a, a related word that is used to describe these angelic spiritual beings. It's found, actually, in the book of Daniel as well. It's in Daniel chapter 4, and it's where uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the ruler of Babylon, is talking. In fact, he is the one who... Uh, wrote chapter 4, if you read it the, the way they have it there, the way it's written, he says there, I saw in the visions of my head while on my bed, and there was a watcher, a holy one coming down from heaven. So the watcher is defined, a holy one coming down from heaven, a heavenly being who's a holy one. This is a spiritual being called a watcher, the holy one from heaven called a watcher, an angel. The word watcher is used again in Daniel chapter 4. And this time a watcher is actually the one who is speaking. Verse 17 of chapter 4 says this, This decision is by the decree of the watchers, and the sentence by the word of the holy ones. So holy ones and watchers equated once again. In order that the living human beings may know that the Most High God rules in the kingdom of men. He gives it to whomever he will, important thing to realize in an election year, folks, and sets over it the lowest of men. So the watchers, the angels, they're making decrees. They are making decisions, apparently, at least in some things. 
working with God in some ways, perhaps in much the same way that God has called upon us to work with him for our own benefit. He doesn't need us, but he gives us opportunity to exercise our, our, uh, our, our dominion over things, our uh, um, uh, stewardship of things. And what, what, what do we make then of this term watcher here? Certainly it seems to fit the four living creatures, the cherubim surrounding the throne of God who are full of eyes. Uh, checked out the, the meaning of the word watcher with some Hebrew references, a, a Hebrew, Hebrew lexicons. A lexicon basically is a, a dictionary, in this case a Hebrew dictionary, with some explanatory notes and covers a little bit more detail than and with some specificity that you might not have in, in a dictionary which goes for more general uses of the term and so forth. Anyhow, uh, Justinius wrote one, a rabbi, many centuries ago, I think the 1700s if I remember rightly. Anyhow, he, he said that the Chaldean word uh, that is that translated in Daniel chapter 4, because actually a good part of Daniel was written in the Chaldean language, or was, was originally anyway, uh, the, the word translated as watcher means a guard. Uh, there's, so there's this protective aspect, a watcher, a name of angels in the later Hebrew from their guarding of the souls of men. So you sing that song, All night, all day, angels watching over me, my Lord. That's biblical, all right? You can sing that and mean it, all right? Brown Driver Briggs, Hebrew lexicon, says that the word means wakeful one all right or watchers of heaven i find the idea of wakeful one very interesting also as the four cherubim are full of eyes that are open or awake all these people walking around today saying we woke you know no you ain't woke <laughs> you fast asleep these angels are woke they're the ones that are watching they're the ones that know what's going on conscious awareness is what we're talking about here that seems to be the idea conscious awareness the angels are very very aware of what is happening in the human world they are awake to it okay and so very important information they, they desire to look into salvation to see what that's all about the Bible says I believe it's in one of Peter's epistles if I remember rightly anyway uh, so, which horseman then emerged from the second seal? Let's get back on track with that. Let's take a look at verse 4 here. Another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth. And, uh, sorry, uh, take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another. And there was given to... Uh, him a great sword a powerful weapon here all right unlike the peaceful negotiator of the first seal remember he had a bow but didn't seem to have any arrows this horseman is all about fighting he took peace away his influence causes people to kill each other and he wields this great sword yet it might be better to view these horsemen quote unquote more as uh, spiritual forces that, uh, or influences rather than as specific people. I'm only saying this because the first one we talked about the Antichrist uh, and connected it to that horseman, but it may not have been the Antichrist himself actually on the horse. It's just that this represents him coming, okay? Commentator F.A. Jennings said that these horsemen were personifications, not necessarily individuals. Now, I think they happen to be individual spirits or angelic beings, much as we saw back in uh, Zechariah. But um, anyhow, but they're not necessarily representing people on the earth during the time of the tribulation. Okay, Even the first one could be construed as the spirit of Antichrist. John the Apostle writes about that in his first epistle, about the spirit of Antichrist already being in the world in his day. And so we have it today as well. Okay, So it's uh, the, the spirit of Antichrist more so than the actual man of sin himself. Rather than just a person sitting there, a human being, the first horseman is more the influence that allows the Antichrist to come to power and to rule. I, I hope that makes sense to you. might be a little confusing, but it's really talking about the influence of spiritual beings and directing things on earth 
in a sense. Uh, and, and what it does is it creates some consistency in our understanding of all four of these horses because I don't think you can uh, relate the other ones so well. For example, with this second red horse here and the horseman on there, we'd be hard pressed to find any individual person uh, described elsewhere in the Bible that would correspond to this rider on the red horse. You know, I mean, what would you do? You say, you know, it's a, it's a, a, a return of, of the King Saul or something like that. I, I don't know. That doesn't seem to make sense. Or Nebuchadnezzar, maybe, because he conquered a lot of places and was in the Bible. So anyway, it's better to see this red horse as a spirit of war, a spirit who brings in conflict that is sent out into the earth to walk to and fro and to bring that kind of influence on the earth to create judgment by putting and pitting people against people. Recall that Jesus told his disciples about one of the signs of the end of this age in Matthew chapter 24, when he told them, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. That spirit is going to reign in that age, see? So what, what is the third horseman from the third seal all about here? The, we're talking about the third one now as we've looked at the second. Uh, let's take a look at that verse, verse 5 of Revelation 6. And it says, When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature come and say, Come and see. All right. So I looked, and behold, a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. Uh, recall that these seals are in succession, right? One, two, three, and so forth. And in Jesus Christ, the Lamb, he is breaking those seals under his authority. He's the one who is bringing these things to pass in his own timing. You know, uh, This progression is therefore how judgment is going to begin to unfold on the earth during this seven-year period. Under the first seal, Antichrist is revealed, and for a time there is some semblance of peace, but it doesn't last. It's peace from such a godless system as that of Antichrist is only temporary. And so, under the second seal, conflict breaks out. The war breaks out. The Apostle John is now directed by the third angel to view the Lamb's breaking of the third seal. Now the horse here is black, and the rider holds this pair of scales in his hand. Right away, the scales hint that this horseman is going to affect the economy of the time. Scales having to do with price, how much for how much, you know, how much am I going to get for this much of gold or silver or whatever, right? And verse 6 in Revelation uh, 6 picks up on that very theme here. It says, And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures say, a quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil in the wine. Now, as you might suspect, all the, the, this is a very uh, high price to pay for so little. A denarius is equal to one day's wage for the average person of that time. And a quart of wheat would be an average person's daily food requirement. Okay? In other words, things are going to be so bad that a person is going to work all day just to eat for that day. And three quarts of barley for a denarius. Well, that sounds like a slightly better deal. <laughs> the thing about it is barley was a grain that was lower in nutrition than wheat and, and was generally fed to animals. And so a day's wage will provide only enough barley to keep a small family alive and with less nutritional value. So there's a higher risk for their health to fail. And why should the oil and the wine not be harmed? Well, in John's day, oil and wine were staples, basic needs. Hey, did you drive anywhere today? Did you get in your car, go someplace? Oil is a basic need today, isn't it? You had some kind of refined oil in your gas tank, an oil-based product anyway, that allowed your, your engine to run. 
and and uh, also the oil that lubricates it and so forth and the, all the machines and uh, yeah oil is pretty fundamental in our day uh, in, in John's day of course it was more for food preparation oil vegetable oil that sort of thing was used to prepare bread and and wine was considered necessary for cooking food and also for purifying water okay the point is that ordinary commodities suddenly are going to become scarce uh, so scarce that what that what supply one has will need to be protected and guarded don't harm it don't allow anything happen to it if you got some hang on to it i mean do you, do you think that could ever really happen with something today like oh i don't know say toilet paper maybe <laughs> all joking aside I can see hints of all three of these horsemen in our own time. False peace, rumors of war and war, economic distress, they manifest from time to time in our day. Is that more than just coincidental with what we're seeing here in Revelation 6? As the process of judgment during the seven-year tribulation unfolds, the Antichrist is going to be revealed, war is going to increase, scarcity and economic woe will grow at astronomically and the fourth seal is the horseman of death the pale horse of death when he opened the fourth seal I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say come and see and so I looked and behold a pale horse and the name of him who sat on it was death and Hades followed him and power was given to them, to all four uh, horsemen, okay? Power was given to them. Over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. A pale horse appears as the pallor of a, of a corpse. The word there literally means a pale or ashen washed out greenish hue and that green speaks of like mold or something it's pretty disgusting overall it's, there's a progression of judgment being carried out here folks a, a, a shortly lived and very false peace that's followed by a hard-hitting war the one who carries the sword up close and personal a bow uh, shoots an arrow from a distance. It's kind of a long-distance weapon, but a, but a sword says, I'm in your face, and I'm fighting you directly, hand on hand. And then famine follows that. And death and hell, quite naturally, are going to parade after all of this to gather up all the casualties. Hades, or hell, is the abode of the dead. And notice the weapons, the sword as we were just saying, symbolic of death by war and conflict. Such war is going to create the shortages of food. People will begin to starve. Killing with death suggests pestilence, disease, and plague. Nutritional value will drop. Immunities go, and disease takes over. Plague, pandemic, dare I say, begins to happen. And it almost seems as if uh, the the uh, nature will be overturned. Some, it says there, will be killed by the beasts of the earth. Take a look at that. The beasts of the earth. All in all, one-fourth of the earth's total population could potentially die here in this four horsemen judgment alone. That would be like wiping out the populations of both Europe and South America today. All of this brings us to the fifth seal, the cry of the martyrs. Revelation 6 and verse 9. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Who are these souls who have been slain for the word of God and for their testimony? Take note that they are under the altar. Back in chapter 5, we talked about the altar. The 24 elders who are around the throne of God are described as having golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Chapter 5 and verse 8. 
So when we talked last time about the prayers and the incense, we brought into the discussion this altar of incense in the Old Testament tabernacle and in the temple as well. The artistic representation on the screen there is meant to represent that very altar, and you can see the, the saints beneath it. Okay, these martyred saints, these Christian believers who were killed because of the word of their testimony, they're beneath an altar in heaven that is set before the throne of God. It would stand to reason that this altar in heaven was represented by the altar of incense found in the tabernacle that was positioned before God's throne there, the Ark of the Covenant, the seat, mercy seat where he was. Uh, dwelling with his people Israel, tabernacling with them actually, pitching his tent in their camp. To further enforce, reinforce this idea, we encounter this heavenly altar later in Revelation chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints. So incense represents prayer. Okay, with all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. See, this is the same altar we see back here in Revelation 6. It's dedicated to the prayers of the saints. And we see in Revelation 6 that these martyred saints, they are indeed praying. What is it that they say? Verse 10, And they cried with a loud voice. Again, it's loud in heaven. So there must be many of them, these martyrs for the faith. They cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and until you avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. They're calling for reparation. Okay, They're calling for a price to be paid for those who have done this to them. This prayer is a prayer, folks, for uh, a call for divine judgment. Prayers like this are called imprecatory prayers. It's when you reach out to your enemy. You know, and, 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 and seek to bring harm against your enemy, to bring judgment, justifiable judgment, on your enemy for the things that were done. The ones who shed the blood of these saints are seen as their enemies. The saints are calling for judgment upon their enemies. Imprecations like these prayers are found in the Psalms. There are imprecatory Psalms where such things are prayed. We're not going to take the time to look at them this evening, but they're there. The martyrs cry unto God for justice under this fifth seal of judgment certainly seems just, and God is just. But they are told that the timing is not right. Not yet. Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed wow very revealing here the obvious implication is they're going to be those who are going to yet be martyred for their faith in christ during this seven-year tribulation time to come the number of martyrs is not yet completed someone's not someone's keeping track of what the count is how many how many are there who will need to be martyred before the judgment is brought upon those who have martyred them. And we also realize this means there will be believers in Christ during the time of the tribulation. We'll see more of that in next week's lesson. Now, Christ opens up the sixth seal. What we're going to do now is read the rest of chapter 6 and then go back over it. I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man, 
hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand? How very telling that this tremendously catastrophic scene of powerful judgment should appear immediately following the prayers of the martyred saints for judgment against the wicked of the earth. In fact, at the very end of this passage, the wicked of all classes of men, they are looking for places to hide from the wrath of, the God, of God and to, to hide from the wrath of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is coming as a judge. The earlier judgments of war and famine and various kinds of disease and death from the four horsemen mostly were of or, human origin, meaning that human beings were involved in bringing that kind of condition about. The events of the sixth seal are more like the whole natural order just simply gone berserk. Behold, there was a great earthquake. It begins with a great earthquake. In Matthew 24, Jesus speaks of the times and events before he comes in his kingdom on earth at the end of the tribulation. And he says that there will be earthquakes in diverse places. Revelation 6 speaks of one great earthquake here. And as we'll see later in the book, there are other mentions of a single earthquake in the book of Revelation. Chapter 8, there is one. Chapter 11, there's one. Chapter 16, there's one. It could be that the four quakes mentioned in Revelation are the earthquakes in diverse places that Jesus declared would take place before he came into his kingdom. The sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood. This does not mean that the sun itself literally turns black or that the moon's surface becomes a literally blood red. It, it certainly sounds to me like some sort of atmospheric condition arises, unlike anything that we've ever yet seen. And it covers the sun, that the earth is in a constant darkness and, and, and reddens the reflected light of the moon when it makes a showing at all. I don't really know what might cause this, but one possibility suggested itself to me as I was thinking about this. What if a great caldera, a super volcano, an underground sea of molten rock erupted under pressure suddenly? There is a caldera beneath Yellowstone National Park in Wyoming. It's what makes the geysers go. All the pressure and the water heated up to steam and exploding. Uh, it's 30 miles by 45 miles in dimension, this caldera that's beneath the ground. I read that if that super volcano or, should, or caldera should erupt, and some say when it does, it could spread massive amounts of volcanic ash for thousands of miles all across the United States, damaging buildings, smothering crops, shutting down power plants. We would experience it here, okay, even though we're, you know, a couple thousand miles probably from, from Wyoming and from uh, Old Faithful out there. Let's add something else to this mix that we're seeing in Revelation 6. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it's shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it's rolled up and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. While we're speculating on global disaster based on this sixth seal of Revelation 6, what if, what if an asteroid from space impacted the earth at or near the Yellowstone supervolcano. And what if, as it fell, the asteroid's composition was such that when it hit the atmosphere of the Earth, it broke into pieces, and several huge chunks of rock rocketed down from the sky? Wouldn't that look like the stars of heaven were falling to the Earth? We have a catastrophe here 
that would indeed cause a great earthquake. It could well blacken out the sunlight with all that volcanic ash in the air and redden the moon and shower the earth with all manner of falling stars. With clouds and smoke rolling, the sky could look as though it were a scroll rolling up, tumbling over itself. And such an earth-shattering event would move islands and mountains. Everything described in Revelation 6, 12 to 14 could happen from a single stellar event like we described. It would make the pandemic, the murder hornets, the locust plagues of Africa, and the riots in America look very, very pale by comparison. Of course, God could send upon the earth some such disaster or series of disasters unlike anything we could ever even imagine. The result of whatever it is gets the attention of humanity. They panic. Black lives, blue lives, all lives mattering. That would be gone from the minds of everyone on earth, replaced by an internalized fight-or-flight instinct screaming into the brain of everyone, my life matters right now, only me. I don't care about anybody else. My life, I've got to do something here. And the kings of the earth and the great men the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave, every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us, cover us over, hide us. See, hide us. It's, they don't want them to fall on them and kill them. They want to be hidden. They want to live. They just don't want to be seen by the face of him who sits on the throne, nor do they want to have to face the wrath of the Lamb. The great day of his wrath has come. And who is able to stand? It's safe to say that by the time these six seals are opened, God now has humanity's attention. As we'll see next time, he then will send out his army of evangelists to tell the world that, yes, the Lamb is coming, God the Son, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus, he's coming again. So I hope you can join us for next week.